Welcome to Bio with Mr. Brown. Today we have a fascinating topic to discuss called niche and population in our study of ecology. So without further ado, please make sure you have a writing utensil as well as your unit one lesson two note packet and let's begin. As stated, we are going to be discussing niches and population in today's notes. We've already learned about what an ecosystem is and how the biotic and abiotic factors exist within our biosphere in lesson one. Today, we are going to further explore how the environment shapes these species and populations that live in those environments. We are then going to explore how ecologists study these populations by examining their habitats and the species role within those habitats. At this point, we should be familiar with the idea that animals and our other organisms will need things in order to survive. These things that they need to survive are called resources. Resources can range from a variety of biotic things to abiotic things, meaning that they can be living or non-living. Some resources that organisms will use or need include water, nutrients, light, food, and space to grow and develop. So animals in our organisms will go off and try to find areas that have all of their resources that they need in order to survive. And these areas that they go and try to live in are known as habitats. And a simple definition for a habitat is the actual place where organism lives, which consists of physical and biological resources. Now it's important to note with a habitat, it's not just for one type of species or organisms. In a habitat, you're gonna find multiple organisms living together. So habitats can be seen as communities where multiple populations of organisms live together. And it's an also important to note that a habitat is going to include both those abiotic and biotic characteristics. Abiotic characteristics like temperature are location relevant to the equator, all right? Those non-living things. And then the biotic factors will include things like the plants and then the animals that live in those areas. The world is made up of many different habitats. On this slide, you will see some of the various habitats that we can find throughout the world, including the desert, grasslands, scrublands, wetlands, and even marine habitats. It's important to note that knowing the habitat an organism lives in doesn't provide much more information than knowing the city a person lives in. Think of a habitat as just as the dwelling place, dwelling place of an organism at a specific point in time. Habitats like the Everglades, our redwood forests, our coral reefs are very large, and large animals such as the Florida panther, black bears, and sharks might roam through these parts and into other ecosystems at a specific point in time. So it's important to note that habitats may see animals, different animals at different points in times due to migration patterns or things of that nature. So habitats, even though they tell us where animals are living, they don't, they don't really tell us much more than that. Say for instance, if we knew where that organism was living, but we wanted to find a little bit more information about how that organism is contributing to the place where it lives, now we're starting to think about an organism's niche or niche, all right? A niche is a full range of physical and biological conditions in which an organism lives and the way in which that organism uses those conditions. So think of it as the job an organism plays in its environment. A niche is only specific to one species. So no two organisms in an environment can have the same niche or they will be in direct competition with each other. And we'll talk about that a little later. So physical aspects are all the abiotic factors to which a species is adapted. For example, 
most amphibians absorb and lose water through their skin. So they must live in places that can support that, ideally moist environments. If an area is too hot or too dry, most amphibians cannot survive. In contrast, plants such as cactuses, which are adapted to deserts, will die if their roots stay wet for too long. Biological aspects are those biotic factors that an organism will require for survival. For example, the food an organism eats, the way it obtains that food, and when and how it reproduces. Communities of seabirds on a remote island, for example, may all nest in the same habitat, but each species may prey on a fish of a different size and hunt in different places. Thus, each species occupies a distinct niche. On this next slide, we start to get a better understanding of niche through the eyes of a warbler bird. In this slide, you can see we have the habitat of a tree. And on this tree exists different warbler birds. You can see we have a black Bernian, a Cape May, a black-throated, a myrtle, and a bay-breasted warbler. And they all live at different heights within these trees. And they feed on the stuff within the trees. Now, imagine for a second if all the birds lived in one location in this tree. They're all different species of birds, and they will all be in direct competition with each other, right? So they will all have the same niche if they were in the same location feeding on the same thing. But since these birds exist in different areas within the habitat, they have different niches. So they may be eating the same thing. But since that food is coming from different areas, they are contributing to that habitat in different ways, which means that they have different niches. So right now we're going to do a couple of practice problems that call into mind everything that we know about niche and habitat. So while we are doing these problems, if you need to pause your video, please do so to write the answers to the questions or even find the answer to the questions. So let's take a look at our first practice question. It's asking us to identify the habitat and niche for each organism displayed below. So when we are thinking about habitat, we need to think about the location in which the organism is living or residing. So if we look at this habitat of an antelope, we see a lot of open grassland, a lot of grass in the picture. The air looks kind of hot. And so I'm going to say this antelope is living or its habitat is an open grassland with dry air and heavy vegetation, meaning it's had a lot of things for it to eat. So now I got to think about this organism's niche or what does this organism do within this environment? And so antelopes have a special stomach that allow them, allow them to digest fibrous plant material. And they are also capable of reaching very quick speeds in order to elude predators. So this is what they do in their environment. Let's take a look at the honeybee. So I'm going to ask you to do this one on your own. Pause it if you need to. But think about the habitat that a honeybee is going to live in. And then think about a niche, a honeybee's job in that specific habitat. In an environment or habitat, it is important to note that there is not an unlimited amount of resources that are able to go around. So there is this, this ideal of a carrying capacity. And a carrying capacity is the largest number of individuals of a certain species that a particular habitat can support. And so this may differ for different species within a habitat, like in a savanna, a habitat can support a certain amount of antelope and a certain amount of elephant and a certain amount of lions and a certain amount of hyena. It differs across the organisms that there are. 
But it's important to note that these carrying capacities are controlled by these things called limiting factors. And limiting factors are those biotic and abiotic, remember living and non-living things, in the environment that control the growth and size of the population. So for instance, how much water is there to go around? How much food is there to go around? How much space is there to go around? All of those are those limiting factors. And so we are able to read a carrying capacity graph to predict the changes that we will see in a population size of a habitat. As mentioned, we can look at an environment's carrying capacity depicted on a graph or a chart. On this slide, you will see two graphs depicted. The graph on the left shows a habitat that is experiencing exponential growth. Exponential growth means there is no cap on the amount of resources that the animals or organisms can take advantage of within the environment or habitat. So if you look at the axes, on the X axis, we have time, and on our Y axis, we have population size. So we're seeing what happens to the population size over time as a result of there being unlimited resources and unlimited population growth. If there are unlimited resources to go around for animals living in a population, the population is just going to continue to grow exponentially, exponentially, exponentially. And this is not realistic. This is not the logical growth that we're used to seeing within an environment. What we're used to seeing looks more like the graph on the left, the logistical growth where we have a carrying capacity. We have limiting resources, our limiting factors contributing to how many organisms can live or be supported within a habitat. And so if we see this, we see that the, the amount of organisms or the population size will reach that comparing capacity and level off, meaning that no more organisms can be supported once the carrying capacity is reached. However, it's important to note that no population or habitat is perfect and that sometimes the population will go above or below the carrying capacity. And that's what we are seeing in this graph depicted here. If you look at this graph carefully, you will see that the graph, the actual line on the graph, represents a population size at a specific point in time. And that dotted line that we see running horizontally across the graph is the carrying capacity of the environment. I want you to notice how that as the graph line is below the carrying capacity, there is room for the population to increase. However, once that graph line gets above the carrying capacity, it's going to start, the population is going to start decreasing drastically. And that could do, be due for a variety of reasons. There may not be enough food to go around. Animals may be in direct competition with each other. Since animals have become so close to each other, there may be viruses or whatnot going down. But the population is always going to get back where it needs to be in order to match its carrying capacity. And that's what we see as time goes on. The population may be below, above its carrying capacity, but it's always going to get right back in line so that the, the carrying capacity of the habitat is met. So when we read those graphs, it's, important, it's a couple of important things to keep in mind. When a population is below its carrying capacity, there's going to be an increase in size. We can expect to see an increase in size when the population is below. There's room to grow. So we will see birth rate start to exceed death rate. There's going to be more organisms being born than there are dying. When the population is above its carrying capacity, that means that that purple star, if we look, 
the population is currently above the carrying capacity. So that means that the population is going to have to start decreasing in size. So there's going to have to be more death rate than birth rate. There's going to be more deaths than there are births. And this is going to happen over and over again until the increases become smaller and smaller. And then we're going to reach a stable carrying capacity towards the end. So let's practice reading some carrying capacities graphs. So as said with the last practice session, if there's ever a point where you need to stop or pause to answer the question, please feel free to do so. So if we take a look at this graph right here, we're going to use this graph below to answer the following questions. Number one, what does the dotted line represent at the 1.6 million mark? That line is representative of the environments or habitats carrying capacity. Number two, if this graph represents the population of gray squirrels in an area, what will be some factors that could cause the population to decrease? So I'm trying to think about what would cause a population of gray squirrels in an environment to go down. And I have to think outside of the box for this, all right? It's not telling me on the graph, so I have to use my brain. So decrease means that the death rate is going to be higher than the birth rate. So these squirrels are dying off. What is causing them to die off? I can become creative. This can be an increase in the predators, meaning that something's eating the squirrels. This could be a decrease in food. Since the squirrels are so abundant, they're having a hard time finding food or there could be an increase in disease going on amongst the squirrels, which is causing them to die. So all of those are viable options. So I'm gonna leave you to do the third one on your own. So take some time to answer the question. If this graph represents the population of gray squirrels in an area, what would be some factors that cause the population to increase? So take some time to answer that, pause the video if necessary. And so that is our lesson today. You all did a great job. Please make sure you fill out your notes in their entirety. If you need to go back through the Ed Puzzle video, please do so. Please make sure you have your notes when you come to class and we look forward to seeing you our next time together in biology. Have a great evening.